is Hugh McShane. So Hugh today is talking about the persistence of temperate perennial forage legume species in a low to medium rainfall zone. All right, thank you, Beth. Um, my name's Hugh, thank you all for coming and thanks to anyone listening online. So temperate perennial forage legumes are clovers such as red clover, white clover, strawberry clover and medics such as lucerne that are grown in a temperate environment um, as a feed source for livestock. Um, so the main benefits for them are they're, they're, high quality, they're a high quality feed source um, and they provide fixation of nitrogen uh, to the soil in symbiosis with rhizobia. So the value of perennials over annuals is their longer growing season. Um, so they have uh, higher overall production and more nitrogen is fixed to the soil. Um, but one of the main issues with temperate perennial forage legumes is their ability to persist long term in a low to medium rainfall zone such as Tasmania. Um, a prime example of this is white clover. Um, white clover is one of the most commonly sown species. Uh, an example of a good persister is lucerne. So, um, however, lucerne, there are issues with growing with companion grasses. Uh, we identified the main, the main limiting factor to persistence in the low to medium rainfall areas is that dry summer period. Um, there have been species introduced to alleviate these issues, such as the one shown on the screen, which is Caucasian clover um, and Talish clover, and we looked at both of these. So research questions I came up with to address the issue. Which perennial legume species has the lowest plant occurrence in a dry land system three years post sowing? Um, how do root characteristics and growth habit differ between these species and how does this relate to persistence? So my research was conducted on a trial site at the Cressy Research Station. Um, the site was previously used as a yield evaluation study um, on white clover, red clover, strawberry clover, talish clover, Caucasian clover and lucerne um, and it was planted in 2017. Um, it was grown on, on this soil, you can see pictured here, uh, it was a classic du duplex soil with three distinct horizons. Um, the A horizon is a sandy loam, the B horizon is a clay sand and the C horizon is a medium to heavy clay, which was quite hard to dig into. Um, so firstly we looked at the frequency of occurrence of each species. Um, this was to give us a basic measurement of persistence. However, it's not a true measure of persistence because we didn't have the frequency count at establishment. We only had the frequency count three years post sowing. Um, so to do this we used a one by one metre world mesh square which was split up into a hundred different squares. Um, we marked each square if it had a species of interest in it um, with the plant base and the roots um, and that gave us a score out of a hundred. Um, we took two measurements, one, one in March, one in August uh, to see if there's any difference but most of our data analysis is conducted with a March measurement because it was more representative of the plant population following the summer dry period. Um, so here's the results, um, focusing on the March results. Um, we found that lucerne had the highest persistence. Um, this was expected, we know it's a good persister. Um, Talish clover, Caucasian clover, they, they were introduced as plants that have good persistence. This is expected based on the literature. Um, and strawberry clover was next. Um, strawberry clover we know has a greater drought tolerance than species like white clover. Um, white clover and red clover were, were the poorest um, and this was also expected. Um, so white clover and strawberry clover both saw significant increases in their frequency counts from the March to August measurements. Um, so this occurred because both of them, as they spread out laterally, they lay down roots from the stolons um, and can establish new plants. Um, from the data and the ob observations, we found that strawberry clover was more successful at doing this, um, and we think it's a that was a contributing factor to its superior persistence. 
because it's able to recover that plant population in the wetter months following a summer dry period. Um, so here's an example of those roots. The photo on the right, um, you can, that was taken in March. You can see the roots from the Stalons just being laid down. Um, the second photo was taken in June um, and you can see the, the amount of root growth just in, a, just in a few months and those roots are just going to keep developing as long as the conditions are right all the way throughout the, to the end of um, spring even. Um, so then we, then we looked at the root measurements. Um, we selected a representative cultivar of each species, um, extracted samples, three samples from each block of each species. Um, using a soil pit like this. Uh, we then dug the soil pit down to 55 to 60 centimetres um, into that clay sea horizon just to see if there was any roots present there. Um, if there was, we extracted them, took them back to the lab, measured for them for diameter. Um, and then with those plant samples, we, we measured the diameter directly below the crown and the diameter of the thickest root 10 centimetres below the crown. So this is what we found. We found that um, lucerne, talish and Caucasian clover all had similar root, root structures, quite thick throughout the profile. Um, lucerne, uh, they all had they all had an abundance of roots in that clay sea horizon. Um, lucerne had the thickest roots there, which was expected. We know lucerne's got quite a deep, deep root system. Um, Talish clover and Caucasian clover do, but it's not, it's not likely to be as deep as what lucerne is. Um, so then we looked at red clover. So red clover had quite a similar root structure in that top soil um, to the Talish, Caucasian and lucerne. However, there was only roots, the roots only appeared in that, in that um, clay sea horizon on one out of the four occasions. Um, and when they did, they were quite, they were quite small. So this suggests that, red, so red clover being a poor persister, this suggests that the persistence of these were highly influenced by the ability of the plants to protrude their roots down into that clay sea horizon. Um, yeah, uh, basically, basically because they, they'll, have, they'll have more access to water in a drier period. Uh, so strawberry clover, much smaller root system. It, we did find roots in that clay sea horizon. Um, not, not on every occasion, uh, but there's likely to be other contributing factors to its greater persistence, such as its greater drought tolerance and its ability to recover population following a dry period. Um, and then white clover with that small root system, no roots at all found deeper in the profile. Um, and and that's because it's just a purely fibrous root, root system restricted to the top 20 centimetres, basically. So I'd put that all together. Um, I've got this diagram here. You can see the lucerne, and the talish and the Caucasian clover, their roots protruding right down into that clay sea horizon. Um, strawberry clover does on some occasions, um, whereas red clover and white clover, they're really restricted to that top two soil layers. So when we're coming into a dry period such as summer, the first, the first soil layers that are going to dry out are going to be that A and B horizon. Um, and then the C horizon is still going to have some available water for the plants, um, basically because it's deeper in the profile and it's, and it's clay, so it's got a higher water holding capacity. Um, so following, going into that dry period, these plants with the roots protruding right down there are going to be able to maintain that minimum water status essential for survival long, for a longer period, period of time. Uh, so then we looked at the root dry weight percentage. Um, find, we found the dry weight percentage and the fresh weight and used this equation to find that out. Um, and this is what we got. So we got Caucasian clover and lucerne as having the highest dry, root dry weight percentage. Um, and then followed by talish clover. This was expected, they're quite a woody tap root, so we thought it would have a higher dry weight percentage. And then we've got white clover, strawberry clover and red clover with the more um, fibrous root systems and that, that was expected. So we plotted that against the frequency. Uh, we found a, a moderate linear relationship. It increased when I removed the um, 
outlier of Caucasian clover, which had a lower, with, which had a lower frequency than the others. Um, but basically, this suggests that the um, the structural compounds in the roots were in a higher volume, and compounds such as suberin, um, which which will limit the water exiting the roots back into the um, back into the soil system. So it's, it prevents desiccation in a dry soil environment. Um, and then we found, yeah, white clover, red clover, and strawberry clover all had low dry, dry weight percentages. Uh, so bringing back to my research questions. Um, which plants had the lowest occurrence three years post sowing? White clover and red clover, um, they were the poorest. Lucerne had the highest, this is what we were expecting. Um, Talish clover, Caucasian clover and strawberry clover were intermediate but good persisters still. Um, and why was this the case? So root characteristics, that deep root system which allowed the, allowed the roots to protrude into the clay sea horizon meant that it, the plants had access to water in a dry period to maintain that minimum water status essential for survival. And the roots with a high dry weight percentage were less prone to desiccation in a dry environment. Uh, growth habit, that was particularly important for strawberry clover um, because it was able to recover its plant population following a dry period. Um, so what does this mean for industry? When, when growers are planting pastures, they want a long lasting pasture um, which gives them good value for money and hence greater profitability. Um, so when growers and agronomists are seeking species selection, they want to they want to select species that last long in a pasture and give it good quality for a longer period of time. Um, so and also for seed companies and breeding, um, studies like this will give them more confidence to develop species such as Talish clover and Caucasian clover. Um, for further development. Um, so further study, I, I think it would be beneficial for a study to look at the persistence throughout the whole lifetime of the plant. Mine looked at just that three years post sowing, it would be need to do it um, straight after establishment all the way through. I think it would be beneficial looking at different seasons and stuff as well. Um, and a longer study, growers want a dry land pasture lasting 10 to 15 years. So looking to study that long, we'll see, see how they how those um, species look down the track uh, and more locations it looks, how different species react to different locations. Um, persistence also differs on a cultivar level, um, so looking at that would be beneficial. Um, and that root composition, my study had to look at the root dry matter percentage but it doesn't look at how, what that composition is of the highly persistent plants. Um, Thank you. Thanks to Rowan, Beth, my supervisors, Gary for helping me out in the field, Caroline for helping me in the lab, and the Whitehead family for a generous financial assistance. Thank you for listening. Yeah, so they, they are grown throughout southeastern Australia and um, in New Zealand and places like that. Um, but they particularly the more commonly sown white clovers, they're, they're a lot more successful in high, high rainfall or irrigated zones. Um, they might still be, they're planted a lot in a dry land system in low, low rainfall, but they they just don't last. They might, you might get them up for the first year, but then they just die out. Um, whereas a lot of the other, lucerne is very common, um, but it's very often grown as a monoculture. Um, and there's not other, many other often, uh, options. Um, whereas strawberry clover, uh, it's not very common. There's limited cultivars available. Um, and Caucasian clover and Talish clover are very new, so there's not much available yet. There may be. Um, I didn't look at the nutritional worth. No, I'm not sure. I know they're all quite high high protein source, the literature says that, they're, they're, quite, sim they're quite similar across the, bro across the broad I think, but um, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think, I think it would. Um, there's the newly introduced species such as Talish clover and Caucasian clover, they're very grazing tolerant, so their growing points are actually underground, so that 
probably wouldn't affect them too much. Um, I know species, the species like um, strawberry clover and white clover, they lay down stolon, so they've got multiple growing points. So that, that gives them good grazing tolerance. But species such as red clover and lucerne, they have to be carefully mo monitored because they've just got that one growing point, and if the if the sheep or something like that get get into that growing point, then it can it can kill out the species. But my the trial that um, I did that was that was mown um, to a certain height, so grazing didn't come into play there. Got a got a question on text, please. Um, so. Um, Rowan has texted me um, to ask a question. So his question is, um, and it's curly, so don't blame me. Um, how might grasses affect legume persistence in mixed swords? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, some some of the some of the new, particularly the newly int introduced species, are known to have, especially during um, establishment, poor competitors, uh, poor competitors um, for, towards the grasses, so the grasses will outcompete them for nutrients and stuff. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm not, I don't, I don't know any details or how it might be relevant, yeah, come into play. Thank you. Deepa said that she, she liked the, uh, the picture that had all the different species on it. It was a good way of... Um, uh, showing all the um, traits that lead to persistence in the different varieties. So um, I have to say on a personal note, I agree, and I'm totally, I've already asked you whether I can steal it for pastoral animal science in the future. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks very much, Hugh. Thank you. Uh, last, but absolutely by no means least, um, we've got someone who actually... Well, it looks at slightly larger animals. So um, Jack Woods is going to come and talk to us um, about his project detecting pregnancy in merino sheep using behavioural.